Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream that is typically a conversation with friends. And today we're having our media episode. So of course, who is here but the lovely Landon. Say hi, Landon. <gasps> hi, Landon. I love the alliteration. <laughs> yeah, oh, of <laughs> course. <laughs> All right. So Interstage Window time, guys. And Landon, what are we talking about today? Talking about Cowboy Bebop. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> no, let me say it once more with feeling. Like, we're talking about Cowboy Bebop, um, <laughs> which is an astounding space sci-fi fantasy uh, anime uh, mm -hmm. about about a group of of a uh, of oh my gosh, what are the words that I am looking for? Gig economists, aka bounty, bounty hunters. hunters. That's the word that I was looking for. Uh, yep. Bounty hunters who uh, travel through our solar system, you know, fighting crime, kind of. Sort of. <laughs> in, order to get, in order to get money. <laughs> That's right. Uh, We're going to talk all about it. Um, so welcome in, Kitty. Welcome in, Squishmallow United. Uh, Squishmallow, rem remind me who you are and what streams you've been in before. Um, I very vaguely remember we, your name. I think you might be Summer, but I'm not entirely yeah, I'm like, certain, so please tell sense. me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah today we're going to be talking about cowboy bebop and it's a, a, a one of our media episodes so as you guys um are familiar we're going to be have like a beautiful presentation we're going to talk all about it so if you um if you have not seen uh cowboy bebop then uh then no there are spoilers ahead many many spoilers this is not a spoiler free show so oh, if you're here we either oh sorry go ahead I was going to say, we also have to mention that we're not talking about the live action because that came out yesterday. True. We are actually <laughs> talking about the original Cowboy Bebop. So if you've not seen it um, and you don't want spoilers, then bye. See you next week. But if you don't mind spoilers or if you have seen it, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. Or if you just want to be spoiled because you don't want to watch it, that's you're welcome too. <laughs> that's fine too. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> Come, come hang out with us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, watching this is not required to hang out with us. You just won't really know a lot of what we're talking about, but that's okay. A lot of times that's I don't okay. know what I'm talking about either. <laughs> yeah, just at times it's like, oh, I said it and it's out there now. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> all right. As we do with every stream, uh, we should start with our favorite things. Yes, we should. I'm we sorry, should. Sorry oh yeah, that. spoiler alert. It's okay. I've got it up on the on the slide. Okay. So, um before we actually start favorite things, Landon, I would love for you to let everyone know a little bit about how uh you came to to watch Cowboy Bebop with yeah. me for this this stream. I was basically told that I have to watch Cowboy Bebop or I can't be co-host anymore. Just kidding. I wasn't. No. Uh, <laughs> no, that's <sorry>. what happened. <laughs> That's exactly what ultimatums. No. So I was a I was a weeb-ish. Uh what I thought was a weeb when I was in middle school because I watched Sailor Moon. Uh <laughs> that is the only anime I've ever watched. In fact, Sailor Moon is the only cartoon show I've ever watched. Uh not ex excluding Disney animated like movies. I'm talking TV shows. I have watched exactly Sailor Moon and now Cowboy Bebop. <laughs> so uh, how I came to watch this is I said, I will make you watch Hamilton if you want me to watch an anime. Uh, and <laughs> we agreed to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I watched it. I enjoyed it. It's a, it's a good show. It just isn't for me. Um, and that's how I did it. So I'm yep. very new to anime, very new to cartoons in general. It's, I was telling Ken, I was like, I am trying. Uh, it's very hard for me to like escape into the immersive experience of cartoons just because I didn't have an experience watching it growing up. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm a noob, basically. It's the best way to explain it. You are getting a noob's impression of anime uh, <laughs> for the first time since middle school. Yeah. Now, I, of course, am quite opposite. I have seen Cowboy Bebop um, several times mm. and uh, and am definitely a weeb. Um, I, I, I've, I've seen some animes in my times. Um, well, welcome in again, TMS. Uh, welcome back. It's been a few streams since we've seen you, but I'm so happy that you're here. Yeah, there's no bad gateway. Sailor Moon rules. But but what you guys have to understand is when Landon says that she's she's not an she's not watching anime, she's not a weeb. It's not really about anime. It's about watching an an episodic show 
um, in an animated medium. She doesn't really have a lot of experience with that. So this is a little bit going to be a little bit different than some of the other media episodes that we've done. Landon and I have very, very different backgrounds here that we're coming to um, compared to everything else that we've watched together. We either had uh, identical or very, very similar backgrounds coming into it, separated usually only by the fact that we're a bit different ages because um, I'm an older millennial, Landon's a younger millennial. Um, and usually that's the only difference. <laughs> But yeah, this no, time, big difference. <laughs> we, we did the whole thing where it was like, yeah, we had both never seen this show. We both have loved the Harry Potter. Like, it was very obvious that this is, we have two, we have about as drastic as backgrounds coming into this particular show as you can. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's just, it was a very interesting experience. Uh, it's nice because you'll discover that, like, we were able to put the show together and talk about the things that resonated with both of us. So it doesn't matter if you're watching it the first time or you're watching it, like, the fifth time, like Karen. Mm -hmm. um you there are certainly themes that that really do resonate in the show which is what makes the show a good show yeah so i have a mission um, you guys this is probably this is probably not the first anime that we're going to watch but i am going to be very picky about which animes i choose do have interstage window episodes because of um landon's background but hopefully in a couple of years after we've made many many of these episodes um landon will will have a confession for us to say you guys karen did it i am finally a weeb I won't. <laughs> but, but she can, you say she that can now. Keep, she can keep trying, and I will keep having to make musical, like being like, we're gonna watch this musical now. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's a difference because I don't really hate musicals, but there are certain That's genres true. I dislike. But anyway, every time I make Landon watch an anime, she can she's allowed to pick whatever she wants, whether I would like it or not. So this is um, my reward. I, yeah. I am easily I am easily fooled. <laughs> five um but no i think it and like i said i'm i'm i kind of threw like death note out there to possibly watch it so if you want me to like write mm -hmm. that in the chat um, i think that would work yes no be like hey let's watch death note and then we can watch that next as far as an anime goes because i yep. think i would actually maybe enjoy that one simply because you know psychopaths um but it's, it's got it's got some land and flavored stuff in there i would say <laughs> um but all of that being said oh my god there's too many episodes there i don't think it would work um but maybe sailor moon crystal the newer one that's got way less episodes we could maybe do that one um okay but all of that being said that's that's other anime for the future a conversation for for later for now let's get back to cowboy bebop and let's start with okay even though you're you're brand new to this and it was not a medium that you were very familiar with what was your favorite thing in cowboy bebop landon i love myself a good villain a good villain with issues and a chip on his shoulder and an obsession with another man uh mm. <laughs> so mm. vicious i clicked all of those boxes <laughs> uh i saw him like i think the first time we see him uh is in the ballet episode where or the opera episode where Faye yeah, where you really opera. see him he is uh, in the yeah, first episode but not really but not no this is like when we really meet him mm -hmm. and uh from that moment when he's like yeah we knew you were coming i was like yes <laughs> just keep talking uh so i do have to say uh vicious was the villain that i wanted and needed in order to really enjoy this show so uh thank you for that <laughs> and you know what cracks me up about you picking vicious as as your favorite thing when i think of like cowboy bebop as a whole as far as anime goes it's very western um, and I don't mean Western as in like the style of Westerns, which it obviously is. I mean like Western media as opposed to Eastern media, right? The tropes that it utilizes and, and techniques that it use a lot, utilizes and things like that. But the most anime thing about Cowboy Bebop is Vicious. Vicious is the most anime thing about Cowboy Bebop. I mean, he's got like the long white hair. He's like very aesthetic. Um, he's got a very like, uh, like very video games type of stylish to to his villainry. Um, he is he is very like um, obsessed with the protagonist, which is very common when it comes to anime villains for for there to be this this like obsession rivalry between the antagonist and the pro and the protagonist, which Vicious has all of that. Um, so it's just very funny to me that the most anime tropey thing about Cowboy Bebop is Vicious. And yet it was your favorite thing in the show. Listen, he's just, he's just got the aesthetic of a scorned ex-lover. So I mean, he kind that's... of is. There's, there's a love triangle going on between oh, him yeah. and Spike and Julia. So, I mean. There doesn't need to be a whole love triangle. It's just him and Spike. It's fine. I mean, uh, you know, there's there's something going on there, obviously, that we don't really learn a whole lot about in canon. But, um, 
But, you know, the fanfic exists. I'm just saying. <laughs> it does. Hello, Roses on my Grave. Welcome in, Roses. Welcome in. Oh, my gosh. All my friends are here today. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> um. Oh, also, by the way, Kendra, same thing. I used to play uh, Sailor Earth, and I'd make all of my other friends play the Sailor Scouts. Mm. Um, so here for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Neil Gaiman vibes. Yeah, I think I think that Neil Gaiman uses uses a lot of the same tropes that happen in Cowboy Bebop, which we'll actually talk a little not Neil Gaiman specifically, but we'll talk about influence in just a little bit. But before that, I, I think you're about to ask me the question, right? I was gonna say, all right, we talked about my favorite thing. Karen, tell me what is your favorite thing? Okay, so my favorite thing in Cowboy Bebop is the Toys in the Attic episode where they have to, uh, where, well, Spike really has to because everyone else gets sick. They have to um, push the old refrigerator out of the, the ship um, because they have, they have all gotten sick off of old food that came to life in the refrigerator. And this is definitely a, a fan favorite episode um, because it just comes out of left field. It's very silly. Hey, Lunar. Um, basically everyone on the ship gets sick from this, this sentient blob mass. And by the end of the episode, you learn that the sentient blob mass was some food that Spike had left in the back refrigerator and they don't use the back refrigerator very much. So it just, it got forgotten about for a couple of years and, um, and that's what happened. <laughs> We've all done that. We've all forgotten about food in the back of the refrigerator for two or three years. And uh, I don't know about that. that. Maybe you. <laughs> Not for two or three years, I don't know. Um, but but it gains sentience. And, and what I, I love about this episode, I love a couple of things about this episode, but a big thing in this in this episode, and this is something that you can only really do in these kind of like episodic things. You can't do it in a, um, in a more structured linear storyline. You can't do it in a, in a movie, but you can kind of have an episode that's just about the themes of the show. It doesn't really engage with the plot of the show very much. It just engages with the themes. And so the thing that I really love about this episode in the beginning is that the the structure of it is as everyone gets sick, they, they teach you a lesson. They'll say lesson one is this, lesson two is that. And some of them are serious and some of them are silly. But uh, Jet's lesson, uh, I got the quote here so I can say exactly what he says. He says, humans were meant to work and sweat to earn a living. Those that try to get rich quick or live at the expense of others all get divine retribution somewhere along the line. That's the lesson. Unfortunately, we quickly forget the lessons we've learned, and then we have to learn them all over again. And it's just like the show being like, this is the theme, guys. Let me just like, boom, hit you over the head with it. If you haven't just gotten it by now, here's the theme. <laughs> here's the theme, and then you'll forget it next episode because humans are idiots. <laughs> um, and so, but but when like, when that episode comes, it's kind of like, it's just this sledgehammer that's like, hey, you, you haven't figured it out so far that this is, this is about how terrible it is to work in the gig economy. Let me just like, just boom like it it just it just comes it just comes at you like a baseball bat to the skull and um and i just i just love that because it's i mean it's not that it's not obvious from here but for a lot of us watching this uh at least i was i was a teenager at the time you know i was a kid at the time so it was just kind of like this like like brain exploding moment um especially upon rewatches of this show which i've done a few times at this point um, so that's kind of like, that's, that's what I think is so beautiful about this episode. But also something that's really wonderful in Cowboy Bebop is that it's all about the music. So it's called Cowboy Bebop, right? And Bebop is a style of jazz where you're expected to just sort of ad lib and do a little bit of whatever you want, right? And Cowboy Bebop's very like that. Some of the episodes are very connected, you know, st with uh, the story beats from episode to episode. And some are just, they're just standalone, right? And, and it's trying to embody this feeling of bebop jazz. And um, and the other thing that the show does really wonderfully is it just, it begs you to pay attention to the music. It is very hard to ignore the music. I mean, when you when you turn on the show and Tank comes in, it's like that, da 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 Like, it's just like so iconic, right? The, the you've got the horns and, and, the, and the piano and this just like beautifully exciting jazz number. And then all of the episode titles are at least um, identically or, or almost or close to it even uh, album titles, you know, or song titles. Right. And if you didn't realize that now you can go back and, and look and uh, and you can see like Toys in the Attic. That's an album title. Um, I want to say it's like an old Aerosmith album. I might be wrong yes, on that, but I think that's right. Yeah. And then uh, one of my favorite 
musical moments in the show is when at the end, what's happening in the screenshot that we've got right here where Spike pushes the fridge out of the uh, airlock and all of a sudden the waltz of the flowers from Nutcracker comes on. And it's just like, <laughs> and then the episode title is Toys in the Attic and it's like the toy song that you think of. And it's just like, it all comes together in this thing that just, it just gives me chills. This episode, even though it's not necessarily plot centric, that it's really just about the theme, I, I think it encapsulates the whole show in a way that no other episode really does. So this is one of the episodes that like, I could watch it just on its own and uh, be thoroughly entertained and happy and, and feel fulfilled and not necessarily need to watch another episode after after that for a moment. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's very funny, the music thing. Uh, it took me an embarrassing long time until I realized that all of the titles are either references to music, like to albums or play off of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took me until I think it was episode like 14 which is Bohemian Rhapsody and I was yeah. like oh is this a theme <laughs> this is a theme isn't it <laughs> um, yeah well I mean and it, it, there's they're throwing so many themes at you I wouldn't necessarily I mean there's got to be something that you don't notice right but oh, yeah. um but hey halfway through it that's that's still pretty good you know no, I mean it was only shouting me in the face but it's fine no and I think that that's something that's uh that's really nice is also the intentional and we talked about this the intentional um animation where they would take time away from like scenes in mm -hmm. a way that isn't done in live action films where they would like like there's episodes or or times when they would like just show the scenery uh and it would be obviously the main focus is the is like the animation and the scenery but also the music that is playing because it really does do a lot of tone setting that doesn't exist a lot in the live action. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has to be so much more purposeful because everything is hand-drawn or drawn yeah. purposely. And that's something that's really cool. Yeah, so, that's one of the benefits of it. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's one of the benefits of the animated medium. It takes less frames in an animation to communicate what you're trying to communicate because you control every single detail of that frame, whereas in live action, you don't. It takes more frames to show something in live action than it does in animation so you can you can take moments and like make things like really concise in animation and 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 it gives you that those moments to breathe and just look at scenery or just listen to music or things like that and for the most part in live action like a lot of times you don't you just don't have time you don't have time you know you'd have to add 10 minutes to your show just to do stuff like that you know or cut things to where and then it wouldn't make any sense right yeah um t uh milner i i I've definitely downloaded the that album, the Cowboy Bebop album from Napster as well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, shall we, in case there's anyone in our audience who is like, what the heck is this show? Should we give mm -hmm. them some history and some yes. idea? All yeah. right. So, you know, we love to talk about this. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to share some of, of Cowboy Bebop's development with you guys. And even if you've watched the show, this might be some new fun facts for you. Um, so Cowboy Bebop is a Watanabe show that aired in 1998 in Japan, it was funded by Sunrise, and it was created actually um, not by Watanabe, it's created by um, Hajime Yatate. But I say it's a Watanabe show because this was his first solo director's gig, and it was a breakout hit largely due to his directorial talent, his directorial eye, right? Um, and all of that is very funny to say because this project started with Bandai saying, we need space toys. Gundam's real popular. We need some more, we need some more space toys. And there's this really funny quote that we've got here up on the screen from Watanabe. Uh, and this is the way he remembers it, that this is the, the direction that he was given by Bandai. And it's so long as there's a spaceship in it, you can do whatever you want. And uh, Watanabe said, oh, wonderful. <laughs> I would love to do whatever I want. Um, but that being said, when Bandai saw that early footage that um, Watanabe had put together, they pulled the plug. Uh, obviously, this was not going to sell toys. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, Cowboy Bebop stayed in development hell for a really long time until Bandai Visual picked it up and decided to sponsor it. And then it eventually it got funded fully by Sunrise, right? And when Watanabe... Um, went out to make this show, he wanted to make something that appealed to both younger boys and 
adults. So with this vision in mind, and finally some funding, Cowboy Bebop production got underway. And at the time, no one predicted what a massive success it would be. And it's pretty popular in Japan, but it is incredibly popular in the U.S. Um, largely because of Watanabe's uh, desire to give it a wide appeal, to make sure it wasn't just for kids, that it wasn't just for adults, that it was some mix. There was a little bit of things in there for everybody, right? So, um, so then in 2001, Cowboy Bebop comes to Adult Swim. So who remembers Adult Swim? Right? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not me. It was mostly cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody but Landon in 2001 was watching Adult Swim. Okay, so for some context, I, in 2001, I was in high school at that time. Um, and Adult Swim was something that I watched throughout high school. I watched throughout college. It was fantastic. Yeah, Space Ghost was my first fictional crush. Good choice, Kitty. Um, I still sometimes think about the Zorak uh, blink sound effect and um, also Brackus Larius. Space Ghost Coast to Coast is amazing. Best interviewer in the world. Um, so and it's 2001 and uh, and Cowboy Bebop comes to Adult Swim. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I'm like, you're like, I was an adult. And I'm like, I was in first grade. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just going to quietly turn off Landon's webcam right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes okay so adult swim it's the new hotness it's the late night block on Car cartoon network everyone's watching it okay so that's where i saw cowboy bebop and i had watched a lot of anime before before toonami even before adult swim all this stuff um but this was different because adult swim was so popular and this particular anime wasn't super anime tropey um, instead, the, the tropes are more like Western, dystopia, stuff like that. So I fell in love with the show, of, of course, you know, being the weeb that I was. But not only did me and my other friends that were weebs fall in love with the show, because it was Adult Swim and because of the tropes that it utilized, everyone fell in love with the show. Everyone that was watching Adult Swim loved Cowboy Bebop. So it was just kind of like this really amazing thing where it was like fandom, like, broke um out of the internet and it was in my real life <laughs> and i just couldn't believe it it was it was one of the first shows that i can remember where it wasn't just my nerdy friends that were into it everyone would talk to you about cowboy bebop you know um except landon of course as we like learned. <laughs> i feel like i missed out on a revolution <laughs> it really was it really was it felt like that and and because and because of the the age that i was like it was literally adult swim was at its peak beginning popularity when i was literally in high school and college so i was like the perfect age right um some other little things about cowboy bebop there is um a manga is so if you you might find that and uh, and for people that kind of know a lot about anime, a lot of times anime is adapted from manga, but that's not the case here. The manga was developed alongside the anime, um, so it's not it's not that that type of situation. There's also a video game and there's a movie and the live action version um, just dropped on on Netflix. And uh, uh, of course, I'm I'm gonna watch it. Um, I don't like well. the clips I've seen so far, but you know I'm gonna try. And we know how well anime shows adapt to Western uh, live action, right? Yeah. Well. <laughs> very quickly, I also, because you said the magic word, and I forgot a very important part of my story is that I actively did read manga and manga mm -hmm. uh, in middle school. I was a weeb in terms of that. Didn't watch any anime, but did read. So sorry, yeah. just had to add that in there. No, no, you're fine. I mean, it's more of a medium question, right? Like, I feel like when you tell me, oh, I never watched this as a kid. I, I don't really understand it. I don't connect with it. I feel like it's the same as when someone is like, oh, I don't read. And it's like, well, that's because the only books you ever read are books you were told that you had to read in school. Yeah. It, it's, you know, until you find something that grabs you, it's very hard to get into a new medium, you know? So yeah, and manga is a different medium than, than anime. It is. Very much so. But I just needed, because I was a weeb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I've heard people argue that Speed, Mater Razor, Speed Racer movie is a secret masterpiece. I don't know about that, but it's very colorful and I enjoyed it. I don't know if it's a masterpiece, but... <laughs> I don't know what that is. 
<laughs> a speed racer is another anime and uh, the the wachowskis made a a western movie from it so yeah cool it's very colorful it's beautiful if you want to just look at pretty colors i i adding, can recommend that adding that to the long ass list of things i need to watch <laughs> <laughs> i don't know about that there's things higher in the list so yeah but but that's cowboy bebop's development that's so that's kind of where we're stepping into into this and and what cowboy bebop was at the time kind of what was going on around it so you guys have um a framework of what kind of the zeitgeist was uh surrounding cowboy bebop Woo-hoo. i mean <laughs> and i know that that a lot of anime found success not as not at the wildness of uh cowboy bebop but found success on adult swim yeah like like and it did those crossovers did start happening i know sailor moon happened around that time ish <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. and I don't think that was Adult Swim, but I think it was Cartoon Network, which I believe Adult Swim was associated with. Yeah, Adult um, Swim was their their late night block. It was their late night block. Okay, so yeah, so I know that there started to be a lot of crossover as far as mm-hmm. anime opening up into the Western market uh, during that time, and obviously has resonated and stayed because now there's giant, huge sections of anime on, like, any streaming platform available. Yep, yep. It is. It's definitely not not just for nerds. Um, there are there are animes for normies too, you know. <laughs> Cowboy Bebop being one of them, I would say. Um, so yeah, and I think, but and I think next, uh, let's actually summarize what happens in Cowboy Bebop. So for those of you that haven't seen it, this is your this is your section, so you can kind of have some context for what we're talking about. Um, for those that have seen Cowboy Bebop. If you want to just listen to me describe what it is, it, I, I think I'm going to do it in a funny way. But if you want to skip this chapter, times are going to be down in the description um, on YouTube. Of course, if you're live on Twitch, you don't see that. You just have to listen to me. <laughs> All right. So I've got some notes here. I've got some notes here for my, my summary. So if I sound like I'm reading, I apologize. Um, but basically, Cowboy Bebop is an anime series with an ensemble cast. So that ensemble cast includes Spike Spiegel, Jeff Black, Faye Valentine, and Edward. Uh, They work in the gig economy as bounty hunters, and they face challenges of keeping themselves fed and healthy, keeping their ship in good enough condition to travel to these various jobs, and facing the inevitable ennui of living in the past and longing for better times. Uh, Jess, the leader of the group, who usually handles the cooking, choosing the bounties, all of those sorts of things. Uh, He's an ex-cop who left the force after he realized just how much organized crime had infiltrated his workplace. And from Jet's perspective, he still wants to do the right thing. So he becomes a bounty hunter where he can track down and capture bad guys from his perspective without all of that corruption surrounding it like when he was a cop. Um, So that's, that's how he sees his situation or what he's trying to achieve. Um, And after doing this for a couple of years, he recruits Spike Spiegel to join him. So Spike is kind of on the other end of the spectrum, right? So he is an ex-gang member looking to escape retribution from his former gang. And together, Spike and Jet become this really famous duo of bounty hunters. Like the Cowboy Bebop is, is famous in this world. So along the way, so when the show starts... Uh, they start to pick up a few other uh, characters. So along the way, they pick up a dog named Ayn, uh, who is uniquely valuable because he can store data. However, instead of selling him, they decide to keep him and raise him because he's just so damn cute. <laughs> the puppy dog tail wags. Yes, yes. And and for uh, if you know a little bit of Japanese, uh, Ayn is also funny because the uh, the name or the word for dog in Japanese is Inu. And Ein sounds very close to that if you actually have a Japanese accent, which I do not. Um, then and so it's kind of like they named the dog Doggy. <laughs> which is just is just wonderful. <laughs> um, so they also pick up Faye Valentine. Uh, Faye is a woman who's awoken after being in a cryogenic sleep for many, many years, only to find out she has no memory of her previous life or the accident that got her into that cryogenic sleep. But she does owe the company who has been treating her more money than she could possibly ever make. Uh, This drives her to become a bounty hunter as well as join the Bebop. Her memories do eventually return, but unfortunately for Faye, they don't provide her any fulfillment, nor do they allow her to escape the death that she's in. 
And then lastly, the Bebop crew picks up Edward, a teenage she-they hacker who is a big fan of Jet and Spike's work. Uh, though happy-go-lucky, she longs for her father who abandoned her and her mother who she never met. At the end, she attempts to reconnect with her father, but it doesn't go very well for her. And she and Ayn presumably go off to start a new life. Meanwhile, Spike's gang catches up with him, and he's unable to let the past go, so Spike decides to face his former gang. His actions end up getting Julia, who was his former girlfriend from when he was in the gang, killed, and then soon after, he's killed as well. With Spike dead, we're left to wonder as the audience if any of this was worth it. Is there value in chasing your past desires, or should we, in Spike's own words himself, simply go with the flow and accept whatever happens, happens? Either way, the Beatles song quoted in the final frame of the show, you're going to carry that weight. And, and we do, and that's how the show ends. So that is a summary of events of Cowboy Bebop. Sounds like a really interesting show. <laughs> yeah oh milner that's too funny um it's remarkable how they've gotten famous given how bad they are at collecting bounties true but they do it with style <laughs> they do they do it with style and also i think it really shows and we're going to talk about this later in the in the stream but really shows that the fact that they are famous and famous at not being rich or popular or even to be able to afford food at times no nope. so uh that's really that's really interesting that they decided that yeah, fame, fame does not get you fortune in the gig economy. So, something to note. <laughs> Two different yeah. things, fame and money. Woohoo. Um, Kitty, who is it that you are? Um, I oh, yeah, we did a personality quiz on, on oh. Thursday. Um, so that's what she's talking about. I got Ed, of course. Um, <laughs> so Kitty got I, Ein. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably be Faye. <laughs> Kitty's cute and full of data. I agree. <laughs> and I think fair. you would get Faye too, Landon. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. So, no, so that's that's what fight. you need to Yeah. <laughs> so that's the summary of events. That's what you need to know to understand what we're talking about um for the rest of today's stream. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, like it it's in episodic style, so it's very similar to like each episode a new adventure happens so mm -hmm. you have your own like plot diagram within each thing and this is the overall story uh this story overall meeting each other happens in the first 12 to 14 episodes mm -hmm. and then the later half of uh spike deciding to go back happens probably in the last seven episodes yeah Ish. i would say so Ish. um so it, it, there are a lot of interesting and thematic uh plots with with lots of different interesting like things that happen within each episode mm -hmm. um but this is a good overview it is 26 episodes long two seasons pretty good yeah and the um and you could and there are like you know jet episodes right and fey episodes right and then there's like filler episodes that that really are just about the theme and not the plot and you know just like you would get in in any sort of episodic it, i would say like it's kind of like a monster of the week show except of course instead of monsters it's bounties uh, so it's yeah. Bounty of the Week. It's very interesting for an overall theme to be very, like, um, spike-heavy. Yeah. Uh, it is a very ensemble show. Like, mm -hmm. it does it does evenly distribute each character to have a certain amount of episodes yep. that are dedicated to their histories and pasts. Yep. Um, the only thing that really makes Spike the protagonist is the fact that the, the first episodes are about him, and then the show ends when he dies. Yeah. Uh, and he also always seems to be the person who's like fucking up and getting them in trouble. True. But <laughs> <laughs> hot takes. Um, <laughs> all right, shall we dive in? I think that it's important because this is such an ensemble cast that we talk about each character, uh, what we know about them, and kind of give context into how they fit into this interesting group of uh, of misfits. Yeah. So let's, yeah, let's talk go. about Jet Black. Mm -hmm. The uh, former cop uh, who who really was betrayed by his his uh, members of the force when they found out how incredibly corrupt the system was. Surprise! Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, it's very sad. It's very sad when it happens because he really is trying to do the best thing and he finds out about this corruption and he thinks he's going to go like report it and fix it and it just, it blows up in his face. It's awful. It's just interesting how something that was in 1998 in a foreign country can be so relevant to uh, <laughs> modern day police politics here in 2021. Yeah. Uh, it, it, great. No, it is incredibly sad because I think the thing with Jet is that he is forever like that lawful good. He wants to do what he perceives as good, what is good um yeah. and and what is right and he he doesn't get the like when he's a cop i think that he's younger he's even more like willing to do everything and then he is utterly betrayed by the people who are supposed to have his back in the system that is supposed to you know prove to be the good guys yeah um yeah. And that's tough. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes on to be a, be a bounty hunter and like, then he's able to make his own rules. But unfortunately, um, because that means he can just be like, well, I don't feel so good about this job. I'm not going to do it. Or I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn this person in or whatever the choice that he makes. Well, then he has to suffer economically and, uh, and struggle and, and be hungry and, and have a broken ship and, you know, all of these things. And yeah. um, it's like, it's like the choice is either, is either be, be corrupt or be hungry um there are there is no in between for jet yeah and i think that's a really i think that that over the years like we don't get to see those years in between we really only get to see flashbacks and we get to see him now um but i can assume as as they kind of set up the character that that has really taken a weight on his morality he mm -hmm. really does come to every single situation and sit there and go Shh, like what is the higher need me getting yeah. fed or me being good uh, and doing the right thing and oftentimes he is more likely to choose doing the right thing but there is a pragmatic like belief of we need to be able to get this done because he's the dad of the group yeah he is yeah the leader. yeah so he's like collected all of these people up and he's kind of like he's kind of like mom um so you often see him like in in an apron like this you know he's the one preparing meals he's the one choosing the bounties right and um and he, he also he also like is is the mom of the group in the sense of like he's way more worried about everyone else's well-being than he's than his own like he has a really interesting take on his arm so that's something we didn't mention in the summary um is that his arm is actually mechanical he he lost his arm that was part of the tragedy of what happened when he was a cop and um, he had it replaced right um, well, technology has gotten much better since that happened, and it's pointed out to him that he could get a way better arm that actually has much better response. He could feel things a lot better than the mechanical arm that he has. And, and he says, no, he says, I'm, I'm not interested. This is my arm. Um, I think that really shows what he's interested in as far as like what sacrifices he wants to make. He doesn't see the arm as important. He sees making sure that everybody on his ship is taken care of is a way more important thing to spend his limited funds on. And not even the people on his ship, but also the ship itself. Like he mm -hmm. is very much the person who's like taking inventory and also kneels the spike and is like, we have things that need to get done. <laughs> Stop sitting around and moping. Um, <laughs> which is basically the first interaction that you see on screen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's like, Stop obsessing, please. <laughs> Um, yes. And yeah, no, it's this whole, it's just also like, I feel like this is a very familiar trope where it is this big, not bad because he's not bad, but it's the closed off, the cold character who is like tall and, and a little bit beefy and is like, please don't stay. I don't want you here. And then characters are like, oh, we're going to stay. And then they're like, fine, I guess I have to cook you dinner now. <laughs> like, it just is... <laughs> It is that very, that's the kind of relationship he has with nearly everybody on board the Bebop. Mm -hmm. um, the, the only exception, I think, is Spike. Um, yeah. and, and with Spike, I think, is more of a, this is a kid where I see a lot of myself in. Yeah. Um, and because they have their foils of each other, but they also have very similar backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think he does, he does genuinely express to Spike that he wants him there, but most everybody else, he really does not. He just expresses it through his actions. And I think that this is really um, best described, like his, his morality in the uh, episode, uh, it's like feng shui, something feng shui, boogie woogie feng shui, that's what it's called, uh, where this girl comes to him out of nowhere and is like, 
you're in this um, serendipitous spot. You must help me. And Jet is like, well, I knew your dad, so I guess so. Um, and he's very reluctant, but but also willing. And, um, and everyone makes fun of him. And it's like, oh, is this your girlfriend? And Jet's like, she's too young for me. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> um, but uh, but he basically takes her on this journey to where where the culmination for this is a side character that only appears in the one episode but the culmination of of that character is for her to basically um confront her her father who she has a very complicated past with and and it gives jet some time to face his past as well and watch how she chooses to to just let it go and of course this is another mission where they make zero dollars um, because Jet just can't bring himself to not do the right thing. Um, so, uh, so, so it, in, it ends up in, in no bounty that they're, they're able to get, but, uh, but he is able to have, help this girl have some fulfillment, uh, in very young in her life so that maybe she won't, uh, carry these burdens all, all the way through the way that Jet has. By the way, Landon, did you know that since this is an anime, of course, Jet is supposed to be only like 35 or something. That seems unreasonable. Yeah, there's no way. That man is 50, is in his 50s. No, like, no, you cannot that, convince me. He, well, because you're going to try to convince me that Spike is like 18 and he's not 18. He is a 20. Right. Let me, let me just Google this real quick um, <laughs> so I can make sure I'm not saying the wrong numbers. Uh, uh, no, but while you Google that, I also want to add on top of this uh, another example as far as um, Jet's like morality and like commitment to good or rightness mm -hmm. uh really is shown in the in the episode with his ex-girlfriend yeah um where he like he is tracing down the the past basically as they all do at some point in time and and he runs into his ex-girlfriend and his ex-girlfriend is basically like the reason why we ended is because you never let me have a say like you mm -hmm. always made the decisions and even then he makes the decision and it really yeah, does show his like almost black and white thinking and the way that he like has to piece things together in order to like he I picture him with scales a lot of the time his morality yeah of like what is heavier and what is not and that idea of like his own the happiness and personal like need of something else doesn't outweigh his need to be right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and his in his black and white thinking so I think that that's also something that's very interesting about Jet yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay, so I just Googled it to make sure I have the right number. So Jet is 36. Um, Spike, Vicious, and Julia are all 27. Oh, um, hey! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> um, that those are a little bit more believable. Faye is 23, but really she's 77 because she was asleep for so long. And Ed is 13. Okay, so here is my actual what I believe is to be true. Uh, <laughs> Jet is 55. Yep. Spike <laughs> is i will say or i will say 27 for him yeah i think that's fine for Spike. Vicious, i feel like is 32 uh <laughs> but never really grew up uh <laughs> julia is probably 25 because you know let's be real uh Faya is actually 19. i'm 100 percent believe that she's barely legal uh, and, and then we got ed who's like 12. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think actually the canon ages fit fine. I'm I'm okay with them except for Jets. No one can convince That's me Jets in his thirties. No. Like I'm sorry. Like I I'm I know I'm jaded to the world, but I am not. You know I am not Jet Black jaded. Like yeah. what? <laughs> oh my god! I just thought it. No, you cannot be. This is he, and he just has too much on his shoulders, and it's just making. Yeah. It has like too much. Like it's not even nostalgia for the past because they all have that. But mm -hmm. it really is that like, like over his glory days sort of thing. And 35 is well within your glory days. So yeah. Like, that. That's stupid. 55, 20 years yeah. older. No, I agree. Like at 35, I feel like I'm in the prime of my career. You know what I mean? Yes. So like, yeah, I don't, I, I reject the idea that Jet is in his 30s, you know? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. He's killed, I'm looking at the comments, he's killed toxic masculinity. We'll go with the apron thing. He's like, <laughs> he's mature. He gets it. He looks at all the people around him and it's just like, you all are children. Yeah. And uh, he has to be in his 50s for that. Yep. Right, yeah. Kitty? Like, Jed is not my age. Jed is definitely older than me. Like, yeah. there's just no way. <laughs> Stupid. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe if he smoked like Spike, but nah. <laughs> yeah, Spike smokes like a chimney. <laughs> well, that's the aesthetic. Speaking mm-hmm. of Spike, do we have anything else about Jet Black? No, um, Jet's Jet's wonderful. Um, Jet deserves the world. I'm very sad that he never really gets anything uh, very good in his life because he deserves it. He He's trying his damnedest, and I respect that. But I think the fact that he doesn't speaks volumes to the scene. Yeah. Yeah, right. it wouldn't make any sense if he did. It wouldn't. Spike! Spike. Okay, so idiot. Spike is our protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I it's not that I dislike Spike. I just I have met too many men like Spike. <laughs> <laughs> he is too close to real life for me to like I'm like I this is no longer escapism. Um <laughs> No, so the thing about Spike Spike's history is that he is an ex-gang member mm-hmm. uh who has who had decided to escape and um and in the throes of everything his he and his girlfriend julia had been separated because of this Mm -hmm. and vicious was who was the leader of the gang uh thought he was dead Um, yes so so basically what happens is like like they they think they killed him right they think they killed him and spike disappears for a few years and then all and then when when he becomes a bounty hunter and the bebop starts getting famous his old gang is like uh i we killed that guy what in the heck (laughs) yeah dead though uh yes and vicious then and that that then ensues vicious uh obsession with him mm-hmm. and um and now and, and then spike being you know the idiot 27 year old uh it was like actually let me go back <laughs> and yeah see if I could antagonize the gang that was supposed to have killed me mm-hmm. uh and left me for dead and uh see if i can beat them now Yep. Uh, and that's that's kind of his whole thing. So he really he he found he found corruption. He didn't like it, and he left, which is why he and Jet are very similar. But he comes from a what is obviously a corrupted background, being in a gang. Yeah. Versus Jet's history of of thinking he's the good guy. So they come from mm-hmm. different sides of of the for, of the law, basically, uh, and find themselves in the same place in the middle, which is yep. I want to help people. And I want to do it as a job and I want to live and be able to make money. Yeah. And also from, from Spike's perspective, like he's gone for these few years and, and they think he's dead. So staying away is kind of his way to protect his ex-girlfriend, to protect Julia and, and to protect anyone that he cared about in the gang. Cause he does actually care about a couple of other people. It's just that, you know, they weren't his girlfriend. Right. But like, he cares about, um, the Jen, that one guy, um, you know, that he, that he, ends up getting killed unfortunately um well, and uh and a couple of the and then there's keeper, yeah like the the grocery store keeper basically mm-hmm. and, like, yep cares about her person. yep so you know he he thinks like oh well they think i'm dead so i'm just gonna stay away but once they find out that he's not dead anymore um then it's like oh well maybe i can get my girlfriend back <laughs> you know so it's not it's she not just revenge there. on yeah. <laughs> so it's not just revenge on vicious it's like well yeah. If, if it's not, if I'm not protecting them, if I can't protect them anymore because they know I'm alive, I should at least go and rekindle these connections. I miss them. You yeah. know, I, I miss these people. Yeah, he doesn't have an obsession with Vicious. Vicious has an obsession with him. What yeah. Jess has is an obsession with getting what he views as right in his. Yeah. Uh, yeah he's, he's instant gratification. He's instant he gratification. He's instant gratification, which is why he's like, he's just, he, he dives in head first. There yes. is no thought. He is due, but he is due without the follow-up because, again, this is an ensemble cast. They all need each other. Uh, so if he was able to be single-handedly defeat everything, then that wouldn't be any fun to watch. Yep. Um, but this is also a huge reason why I feel like he is the protagonist of the show is because he is the one who is constantly doing things to move things forward. Yeah. Um, and he is the one who's constantly, like, going head first and not listening to Jet's advice, even though Jet is older and wiser and does know how things work more <laughs> so than Spike does. Um, and Man, but you can't he... tell a 27-year-old that. I mean, let's be real, Landon. <laughs> this so is why sorry. you've met so Hold many on. Spikes. Hold <laughs> <on>. <laughs> this is This is why you've met so many Spikes, right? Because you're single and 27. <laughs> But in this moment, so in this moment in the, in the screenshot, what's happened is, um, is, is Vicious has basically put out this, this bait 
this bait for Spike, and he's, he's called it Julia. And so Ed hacks in for them, and um, and they find out that this this thing is called Julia, and Spike, like, freaks out. He's like, Julia, 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 um, because that's what it's all about for him. It's it's about the, the obsession, and it's like, well, if they don't think I'm dead anymore, why am I hiding from Julia? Let me go get what I want. And they're, look, they're taunting me. They want me to come come do this. Yes, they they do want you to fall into the trap that they have set. <laughs> but he they doesn't do see know, it that way. They do know that you have a big head who thinks you can take this down alone, even though yeah. literally everyone in your life is saying, "Stop doing this." Um, he just and and said with with love and understanding that like this show would not be the show without a character like Spike. Absolutely. Um, that, that It'd be boring. <laughs> It'd be so boring. Nothing would happen. Uh, mm-hmm. And there are times where Spike lives up to his big damn hero complex. Yeah. He does live up to this idea of like, just, he, he is really good at what he does. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also has an incredible sense of morality given his background. Uh, yep. But he still is so insistent of head in first thought later yeah that it it ends up getting him killed yeah it unfortunately up him killed it gets, ends up getting julia killed uh yeah. it, it ends up and a lot of times it ends with with all of them being in danger Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, like, uh, uh, this this episode, this is called, one's called Brain Scratch, and it's towards the end. So the way that the show is structured is the final episode is really, it's a two-parter, so it's really the final two episodes. The episode before that is establishing the ending story of, of Faye and, and everybody else, right? So we're about to do the two-parter with Spike's ending. But the episodes leading up to those last three are all about bounties where... Um, what's driving them is a need to be a hero. So it's really showing us that what the show thinks about somebody who runs in guns a blazing and is just obsessed with being the hero without thinking it through, right? So we've got these episodes leading up to it where we've got we've got brain scratch where it's this person in a in a coma that has decided that. Um, they are going to create this religion because people people need this and and they're lonely because they're in a coma, um, you know, and so they can only communicate on 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 well through television. It's it's online, but it's it was made in the 90s. So <laughs> um, the way they explain it isn't how it would actually have, have happened with the way the Internet is now. But anyway, and then there's the episode um, with the big uh, with the big cowboy guy who comes in and he's like this larper that's like a rich dude but he's like i want to be a bounty hunter so i'm gonna pretend that i that i care about this gig work you know it's kind of like when celebrities go and and stream on twitch and you're like my god and some of them suck at it you know (laughs) so it's like that so glad that you have more more watchers than we could ever dream to have and you're just sitting there blinking at a screen yeah and you're just and you're sitting there silent like i wish i could do that my god um and then and then the other (laughs) i mean i'm pretty but i'm not that pretty i'm just saying (laughs) okay well where's it where's the landon stream then (laughs) keep saying it will happen Someday. Okay. Anyway. Um, and then the other episode um, leading up to this is the the clown episode, the LeFou episode. And um, and it's about, you know, somebody that, uh, again, they're they're very lonely. They have this need to express themselves. They have these these obsessions and these feelings that they can't keep inside. And so they 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 go and uh, just like reap destruction. Right. And I think all of these episodes show like slightly different takes on this concept of what it is to just run in guns a blazing and all of these characters all these bounties of course are punished in the end none of them get to really succeed in what they want like the closest thing we have to that is is the cowboy guy who just um basically decides like oh a cowboy wasn't for me i'm gonna go be a samurai now so he doesn't really get punished unfortunately but he's rich so you know he doesn't but but the clown guy does the, um, the guy in the coma does, you know, so the only way to escape your punishment is to have a lot of money. Um, Spike hey! doesn't have a lot of money. <laughs> he found another theme! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is very, very important for Spike's character, and we're meant to understand this um, not only from what he does in the show, but from the way several bounties in the show uh, act that share traits with him. 
So yeah. Oh, psych. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, just because we have a lot to talk about we could talk about spike forever uh, but just because we have a lot to talk about we do have to go to the next one so landon's we... favorite <sighs> listen <laughs> i i understand that i am probably Faye out of all of these characters i love and you very I much <laughs> that she told us from day one that she wasn't interested in a team dynamic and yet every time she fucking left and got in trouble and then asked for home and then called home and was like, hey guys, I need a little help down here. Uh, it made me so angry. <laughs> <laughs> it made me so angry. <laughs> uh, and Did you see a little bit of past Landon in there? Is that, is that kind of what was happening there? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what makes I, Faye a great character. <laughs> I don't, you know, take on more than I can handle and then ask people for emotional help when I have a breakdown. No, never, not me. Um, <laughs> past Landon, now a Jay Landon. Um, no, and then, and then there's other things too that we are going to get onto, but I want to focus on her history and her past uh, before yeah. we get into the big, big item ticket that really... Uh, it was, a, I think, a huge component as to why I disliked this character mm-hmm. and it not being her fault. Yeah. Um, so it's Faye, but Faye is so funny. Like, she straight up tells you, this is who I am. Yeah. This is how it is. Um, I, I am not changing. I like who I am. And you'll just have to learn to deal with it or we're not going to be friends. Sorry. Like, you know, she does call home, but there's never, an, there's never like, um, there's never not a choice. Like, they can choose to not go get her. But Jet has to do the right thing. And so, of course, he's going to have him and Spike go save her. Duh. <laughs> I also know that it's my fault that I didn't believe her. It's I have been fooled by Western, Western film adaptation of women characters to be like, I'm never going to be a part of this team. And then they forever be a part of the team. <laughs> like, I was tricked. I was brainwashed into thinking that that's how characters are. And then when I met this character that was like, I'm not going to be a part of the team. And then d- didn't be a part of the team. Mm-hmm. I, I, I got, I was angry at myself, not her. I realized <laughs> I did this to myself. Um, but face great. <laughs> I mean, one of the best episodes of the show is where you really first learn about her past and 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 the thing that happened to her when she first woke up from the coma and uh, and that man that that kind of sort of was her boyfriend kind of sort of took advantage of her and it's like well gosh if that's the first experience really in your memory which it is for her for many many years before she recovers her memories during the show um like it, imagine like staying in one place like why would you ever of course she bails the second she thinks she can why yeah. wouldn't she cuz they're going to do it to her it makes sense it makes absolute sense Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and she is wonderful because of that because it is it is a true uh show of of realistic characterization yeah Uh, and also i think another person who is as willing to get them in danger as spike is for (laughs) very dissimilar reasons like there are a lot of similarities as far as like having to leave and the instant gratification and then expecting people to come help Um, And even then, she doesn't really necessarily expect them to come help. She just asks, and then if they don't show up, they don't show up. I mean, she's just using Um, all of the tools in her tool belt. That's really all she's doing. But there is a very different reason. Spike's reasoning to go into everything is all ego. And I feel like Faze is just all situational. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and, And not necessarily being like, it's not her fault. But it, a lot of it is, okay, yeah, I'm just going to use you as a tool. Whereas Spike goes in and is like, wait, you mean you're not going to help me mm-hmm. clean up this mess that I made? And Faye is mm-hmm. just kind of like, hey, if you'd love to pick up a mop, I'd appreciate it. So yeah. it, is, it is two very similar situations that move the plot forward, but very different reasons and very different characterizations. Yeah. Um, Kitty, yes, there there is an early comment on where um, where Jet is pretty um, offensive towards Faye, and I feel like he's talking about when he says that, like he says men and women, and but what he's I think what he's really saying it, when he says men, he's saying me. This is how I live, and this is how 
my exes are. Like, that's what he's really saying, you know, which I think is probably true of a lot of men that think that way. What they're really talking about is themselves and their exes, not men and women. You know what I mean? Um, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, so he's pretty, he's pretty damn misogynistic towards her. He, he really is. <laughs> I also think that that's the misogyny of this show. Oh yeah. This show is, is, and that's, that's, spoiler alert, that's the second half of this conversation. Yeah. Uh, and if we want to get into that right now, we can or I can. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. This show is so, like the, the other reason I really dislike Faye is how misogynistic the show looks at women in this show and looks at her specifically mm -hmm. um the amount of sexualization in her art and how it becomes a huge part of her character yeah. whether she uh is doing it purposefully or even not mm -hmm. to me just put a terrible taste in my mouth i was like i would love to get to know this character beyond her tits yeah uh, i understand that it is it is a definite demographic that people are shooting for to to encourage people to watch this show because there's a hot anime girl with large tits um and therefore we must make them bounce in an unearthly way <laughs> but <laughs> we're in space so gravity isn't a thing um but it was incredibly distracting every single time this character was on screen <laughs> and she and, and they that, have like <laughs> And, and they have like four sexually attracted to women part of me speaking that is <laughs> that is the feminist in me um, and there's like maybe four or five different episodes where she's taking a bath and i know that it's part of her character to like lays around and to to take all the um earthly comforts whenever she she can but like does it really have to be a freaking naked bath every time like there's other ways to show creature comforts you know yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's not even like it's it's not an empowered sort of like I'm sure there can be an argument saying that this character is trying to be that. I mean, I think she feels empowered, but yeah. I don't think that's what they were meant to write. And that's, and I don't, yeah, and I don't think that that was part of her character. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that that is an interpretation that somebody could make of her, but I personally, in canon, don't see much proof of her sitting there and being like, I am displaying myself like this because I am empowered versus I am displaying myself like this because my artist drew me like this so that I can, uh, you know, give feelings to young boys who are watching this. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the in-universe explanation is that um, Faye is is very much the type of person that's going to do what she wants and, and she's not going to let anyone tell her what to do. Like, that's the in-universe explanation. But I just, but I don't feel like she is... Um, embracing of her sexuality um, mm -hmm. in in that in that way, because really the only time we see her embracing any sort of sexuality is the past that she has with that that guy that worked at the at the um, hospital, and and she's ultimately betrayed by him. And so every other time she expresses her her sexuality, it's to get something. So, but we so we never see her as like this very. She's not like a very sex positive character. And why would she be? God, she's been betrayed by men so many times. So of course she wouldn't be. It wouldn't make any sense. Um, but uh, but yeah, she's definitely not like the, the character that's going. I'm I'm sexy and it makes me feel empowered. You never get that yeah. sense because you never see her be sexy. You know, for for her own. You know. And this is and this is the reality too. Is that she is the only consistent woman of age who is who is a consistent player in the show we see yeah. julia a little bit and we'll talk about julia in a second um but for the most part she is the representation of women like unfortunately yeah. she is that is what happens when you are the only woman in an ensemble cast you become the representation of women and how the showrunners view women yeah uh and it's it's not good. <laughs> it is extremely <laughs> uncomfortable looking yeah. at it from a 2021 grown ass woman, uh, post me too sort of movement. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I have to say this was much easier to swallow when I was a kid and didn't know any better. Yeah, no, I can, I can definitely see that. And then like, it's not just her though, too. It's like almost every single episode, there is a, sh you know, a snapshot to a porno magazine with women who are barely covered up or, mm -hmm. you know, someone or like a security guard has a poster of a half naked woman on wow. their on their thing. And it just is the little hint of sexualizing women and drawing them in provocative ways that that really rubbed me the wrong way. 
Mm -hmm. um, that really made it re hard to enjoy this show because I was like constantly aware of it. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's just a lot. Milner, she was hungry. Okay. She was hungry and dog food was what was in the fridge. Yeah. Uh, women like to that. eat. <laughs> women do get to eat. And then also with that, like, she, she also like you, like use that as like a, a, oh, a woman needs to be pampered. So I get to have this food. Like there was also a very sexist throwaway line on top of her eating dog food. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah, it's not good. Um, yeah, and and unfortunately, um, one of the things in this this show is you can tell there were not really women writers working on it because there is no like sexualized man and um yeah. and really back back then I don't remember a a lot of media that had you know a, a sexualized man and you might think like oh well you know they're they're strong and 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 sexy and like Spike maybe is strong and sexy or whatever or Jed is but when you actually see like women writing sexy men that's not how they do it like that's not how they do it. Um, um, and you can argue also that I, that Cowboy Bebop is doing this partly because it's trying to fit into the the tropes um, inherent in the Western genre, right? Um, where women are often sexualized in in this way, and that's really the main way that you that you see them. Um, but uh, but there are opportunities to expand this a little bit and make this a little bit better. And I think Julia, um, kind of as you had alluded to, would be talking about her a little bit. I think she's the perfect opportunity. Unfortunately, Julia does not get much of a backstory on her own. We really only know her through Spike's eyes and the way Spike sees her, and then a little bit of the way Vicious sees her. But she verily, she really doesn't get to express herself as as outside of Spike and Vicious. And I think that's a shame. And it's something that would have, it would be, would be one small improvement on a very good show would be to give Julia a little bit more before we get to that ending, ending two episodes. And I think that that, it's just a perfect example of how the show treats women. Like it just, yeah. because they didn't, they didn't feel the need to. She was at the center of a love triangle and she was a purpose for the plot to move forward rather than necessarily a actually full-blown developed character. Yeah, uh, but there's she, hints. There's hints that she that the, she the writers had. Yeah, there's hints that the writers had ideas for a backstory that that could have been really intriguing, but they just don't dig into it very much. Because they don't need to. Because the yeah. story yeah. is already telling itself of two men who are obsessing over one woman, uh, and that's enough to drive the plot forward. And you don't need to develop a woman if they're going to just die. Like yeah. that. Just that is the. I feel like that really is the early two thousands take on women characters and this is not <laughs> the only place in there i also wanted to call back something that you had said uh, a little while ago as far as like uh as far as like this anime really trying to go towards western culture uh and they are absolutely but i also have to say anime itself has been known to be very sexist against women not oh, yeah. all of them, obviously just like not every single tv show um but they're that that's not a western concept to sexualize women in no, I mean way. more more westerns as in like cowboys. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's just so hard. There's two. I know. Westerns. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, so I mean, absolutely. a part of the reason it's doing this is 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 because it's trying to um to use tropes from the western absolutely. genre, so like and cowboys saloon, and things. And the saloon girl who is the distraction is a hundred percent part of the western genre. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And that's um, what Faye but, is. But it's it's also like this is not uncommon. Yeah. Uh, so and I just, but I feel like, I feel like there's examples. So this is one of the things that I'm really interested to see how the, the 2021 live action Netflix version is. Cause I feel like the fix for this is very easy. It's literally just make Julia a more full fledged character, give her as much screen time and attention as vicious. So bring her up to the level of the antagonist in the show. And I think that would really fix my, my negative feelings towards the way that women are in the show. Cause then well, we have another like, example besides Faye. I feel like giving Faye also a, a reason like I'm not even saying change how she's dressing I'm saying give her the backbone and the and the and the the support within her character to purpose to make these purposeful rather than it feeling like the clothes like it's like the that like are the clothes wearing you or are you wearing the clothes mm. like give the character <laughs> the support to wear the clothes but rather than the clothes wearing her yeah uh, and, and so that, maybe like vary up the bathroom of, scenes a little bit like maybe it's, it's not a bath sure. every time maybe sometimes she's doing her nails or her makeup or something <laughs> absolutely or like or like just I mean there are so many different ways and it can I think that it 
I, I also think that framing probably is part of it. Her tits don't need to be the center of everyone's attention. <laughs> uh, and I, I as nice as as nice as anime tits are. That being said, great art. <laughs> I'm not unhappy at it. I mm-hmm. hentai is g- cool, whatever. But like at the same time, coming into this, trying to watch it for the plot, I was very distracted. Yeah. Uh, and 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 just it it made it really hard to connect to this character. Um, that I feel like I'd have a lot of connection with if I wasn't so just constantly angry at it. Well, maybe you'll like her in the live, live action version. Like, I, I struggle to imagine that she'll be the same in the live action version. If she is, I'll, I'll be very confused. Like, why I would you be, do that? I would be like, why did you not take yeah. this forward? <laughs> yeah, no, Kitty, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's it's pretty obvious that's what she's doing because she when she does engage with her sexuality, it's always to get something, Right. Um, so I do think it's it's a tool that she's using as a survivor, but she but she never says that. No one ever set, points it out to her or anything like that. It's just the audience yeah. is supposed to understand it. And also, if it is a tool, tools aren't to be worn all the time. Like, I would yeah. love to be able to see her when her tool isn't being used so that you can tell that there is a difference. I feel like that there was no difference in this character. Uh, and yeah. maybe that's just how the character is, but that was also never clear. So give us a scene where she is by herself and she doesn't have to elude sexiness because there's no one else to be <laughs> sexy for. Like if she is being sexy to take advantage of the men around her, completely yeah. legitimate, love that, think it's fantastic. Give me a scene where it's off um, yeah. because she doesn't need to be like that all the time. And then yeah. it feels purposeful. Yeah, I think the closest like thing we get to that, the closest thing we get to that in the show is her confrontation with Gen, but that confrontation becomes a lot less about Faye and her sexual wiles and more about um Gen and and Gen's journey as a non-binary person right yeah. so um that's that's what that's about so that I think that's the only time in the show where you really see her feminine wiles sort of fail her um and then it's also it's also so, yeah. very hard to have a very misogynistic character who Spike is and also have a character who who uh and have the only female character live up to those misogynistic beliefs. yeah like that's yeah. the other thing too is that a main character says something incredibly misogynistic, and the only female character that is consistent throughout constantly proves that misogynistic character correct. Yeah, and it's unfortunate, but it was it was the '90s. Um, the the genre that it's in that this is the tropes of the genre. So um, you know, it's it's just no no show is perfect. Okay, when you watch it enough times, you'll find things that you dislike about it. So this is one of the things that I actually think the live action version could do better, and I'm really curious to see. If they do, if I was going to make any change to Cowboy Bebop, this would be the change that I would make. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to Ed. Okay, so we want to recognize that Ed is also a girl. (laughs) Like, if you ask, if you ask Ed, Ed will tell you that that they are a girl, but they are also just Ed. And there's a lot of ambiguity around uh, Ed's gender. So, you know, you might say, if we're, we're talking about, but women are represented like this, this, and this, and you're like, but what about Ed? Well... I think Ed, it's it's different in anime and in, in Japanese when someone's non-binary, their pronouns and stuff, it just works very different. But to me, Ed reads non-binary. I'm sorry, Ed, Ed Ed's not a woman. I mean, they also, are, but they're not. Isn't Ed a child? Yes, Ed is 13. Like, you can't, 13, I was going to say they're 12. Um, You can't compare the two. Like, Ed is not a represent, even if they weren't or didn't read as non-binary, they are not a reception of a representation of women because they're no. not a woman. They're a too young, <laughs> too young. <laughs> uh, and I bet if they did make Ed a woman presenting uh, character, they would also be as highly sexualized as Faye. Uh, Probably. That, that is not, they're, they're 13. Uh, yeah. So thank God <laughs> they're not uh, in the same category as women. Um, yeah. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> very true um but what what ed really brings to the table and uh and ed ed's a fan favorite character everybody everybody loves ed that watched cowboy bebop as a kid um but what ed's really bringing to the table here is they are forcing the found family trope like the found family trope is is present because jet is collecting all of these people but ed comes into the show and ed says 
oh, the Bebop is famous. I want to be part of the Bebop family. I don't have a family. I want to be family with Spike and Jet, these people that I've grown to know parasocially over the internet and I think are so damn cool, right? And so Ed kind of like weasels her way onto the Bebop in a very cute exchange between her and Faye. Yes, that includes that line, wait, you're a girl? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, canonically non-binary. I think I think they are non-binary. And we'll talk about diversity next after we talk about Ed, and I'll give some more thoughts on that. But yes, I think Ed's non-binary. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, we do have to remember in, in uh, 1998, when this was first produced, the term non-binary did not exist. And even the concept of ungendered uh, was very rare, especially in Japanese culture. Yeah, uh, I mean, it still doesn't so even really exist in Japan because their pronouns are structured totally differently. Yes. You know, because they have for their personal pronouns, like when I when I we say I in English, like for I am, right? But in Japanese, you have different pronouns. Like there are ones that that are a bit more formal. There are ones that are that are, tend to be used by women. There are ones that tend to be used by men. Um, and it just it very it it depends. So typically, non-binary characters in uh, in anime. So here's how you can spot it. We'll use Boku, but Boku it's not really a non-binary pronoun. It's really um for young boys. And, uh, and so there really isn't, there isn't really a, a good way in Japanese to say, I am non-binary. Yeah. And it's, and, and again, like, we'll also come to that with diversity. We'll talk about the terms that were used in the show versus what they would be now and all that fun stuff. Yep. Um, but but yeah, yeah, Ed has found family. Ed's found family. They're, they're, uh, they're an orphan. Um, their mother is not around, presumed dead. Their father has abandoned them. And, um, and, and basically when we meet Ed, we don't know this at the time, but they're living in kind of this, this foster child, like home system. And, uh, and they've decided to run away and join the bebop. <laughs> Ed finding his family online was so ahead of his time. True. <laughs> uh, yeah. it, oh my God. Yes. No. And it's, I think that I was, uh, sorry, I was past the age to really in like connect the character of Ed um I I could understand why he is a fan favorite like Tumblr fan favorite uh for me they're very young and see I'm using the wrong pronouns right now uh it's just really sad but yeah no I think that they're they're they have a good arc they're a very interesting addition into the bebop uh again the child who ran away and you know joined a crime hunting cr criminal hunting organization that was famous on tv is uh a lot but you know what? <laughs> it could happen <laughs> yep um <laughs> just another thing for the 55 year old to take care of um <laughs> but yeah no i think that found family trope always hits and it makes sense yeah, and I just love it. I love it with Ed. Now, we have to remember um, Cowboy Bebop, Watanabe's goal with it was to appeal to kids and adults. So you got to have some crazy teenager somewhere. And I just love that in Cowboy Bebop, they chose to make the crazy teenager the the smartest one, who's the hacker, which is just wonderful. You know, things that things things that don't match. I love that when they go together. And also chose uh, to make them, you know, a, a, a non-binary uh, girl. I mean, I, that's basically how I think of Ed. I think of Ed, Ed as like a she-they type of person. Right. Yeah, I think that uh, their gen they made their gender neutral enough mm -hmm. that it's not a conversation. Little boys, like ch small children, are going to enjoy Ed either way. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's not it's they did a really great job of not setting a particular gender for their advertisement and marketing for the younger generation. Yeah, I definitely think that for their older generation, there's more of a skew towards uh, males here. Mm -hmm. Um, just with how anime also is, um, but for the younger generation and those advertising to the, you know, tweens to teens, it, to relate to Ed definitely makes sense as far as absolutely uh, not wanting it to be gendered. Yeah. So, I, so I those think of us that was purposeful, mm -hmm. even if there is no acknowledgement within canon. Yeah. So those of us that were that were teenagers watching this on Adult Swim, you know, it was kind of like. Uh, you know, Ed was supposed to be speaking to us. Absolutely. 100%. And Ed's so fun. Ed is so fun. Um, and, and if you're not kind of like, I think until you get to the episode where you find out Ed's past and the fact that um, the reason why Ed wanted to join the Bebop so badly is because she lost her father, you know, her father abandoned her. 
Um, I do think that that as an adult, Ed is kind of just this silly little distraction and you don't really see how she fits into the larger theme very much. Um, I think what it looks like up until then is she's func she's functional, right? She's she's the group's hacker and the group needs a hacker, right? Um, but she's not, but she doesn't fit into this theme of like uh, the gig economy and the ennui surrounding it and all of these things until you get to that episode, which is very late in the show um, when you find all of this out about Ed's dad, so... I think that that was also a hard reason for me to connect to Ed is because it was that like, it's almost like the jokester of the group. Like it was yeah, the, it, comic it was relief. Like the, oh, the comic relief. Yeah, yeah. They were the comic relief of the group, and it was like, okay, this is I don't need this. And then yeah. you hear, and then you get the you get the backstory, and it's like, oh, this poor baby child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ed does have a big heart despite what she's been through, and I think that's because she's so young. The world hasn't totally. Um, beat it out of her yet like it has with a lot of the rest of the bebop crew you know so ed still has a lot of uh, a big heart and a lot of light inside of her um that's uh this just it's just not been snuffed out by the the harshness of the world not yet yeah uh and then of course we have her ending um yeah she does not go into the final battle um she and i run away yeah yeah life so, for themselves yeah so i i like i i guess i kind of the way i kind of imagine it is that um you know once once ed realizes that uh that the bebop is on on its way downward it's not going to survive much longer um and and she's i, I think she feels old enough and experienced enough to go have her own life she does not need to necessarily rely on others anymore she kind of takes the dog and, and leaves, and it's a very sad, bittersweet ending. She doesn't get to reconcile with her father. She um she doesn't keep any connection with, with Faye or Jet, really. We're led to believe that she literally just goes off on her own and disappears, because in the episode where we learn about her past, we get told by the, the woman that runs the kind of like orphanage thing that she stays at that that's kind of Ed. Ed would sometimes disappear for months at a time and then show back up, and that's just how she was. So so we're led to believe that she just goes off with Ayn, and, and she disappears and, and starts a whole new life that we know nothing about um it's it's a little sad it's a little bit sad you know i think it's a beautiful realistic take on a character yeah. um that because yeah if you if your found family isn't working anymore then you take what leave you you take what you can and you leave and especially, you at such a young, especially at such a young age mm -hmm. uh and that's what she has been taught and what she is going to go do and it is it's interesting to also have such an unsatisfying ending um because the other endings are satisfying even if they're not happy yeah um they, they, they at least are, complete the circle <laughs> they don't leave you thirsty yeah they complete yeah. the circle whereas ed's story doesn't um yeah. you're kind of like the way that they leave it is kind of like you are to make those connections that hopefully she went off and and had a good life and and she wasn't alone because <laughs> thank you kitty <laughs> uh, she wasn't alone um but it is that it is that tragic sort of like okay this is yeah. this character is going off and is going to live the rest of their lives and you, as the audience who have fallen in love with this character, don't get to see that. Yeah. Um, also wouldn't be surprised if they had been setting it up for a spinoff series, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? I mean, that never happened. So, so who knows? Who knows? Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's what's lovely about Ed. And one of the other things that's really lovely about Ed, which kind of leads into the next thing that we want to talk about is Ed's non-binariness. So for, for those of y'all that don't know when it comes to diversity in Cowboy Bebop, it was purposeful. Watanabe set out to make sure Cowboy Bebop was diverse because in his vision, this kind of this kind of future of the world where it's it's mostly nationless and things are being run um, more like a, a corporatocracy and, and various things like that, and there's this big gig economy. Um, he knew that if he made it look very Japanese, which most anime does, most anime is just full of Japanese characters and really not much else. Which um, makes sense. That it, yeah, <laughs> that it just it, that it wouldn't sell. Like it wouldn't it wouldn't sell the idea of this massive multicultural um, world that that encompasses all of space, right? So you have it, I I can't think of another anime 
that has nearly as many well-drawn black people. I just, I can't. I can't. And this was 1998. Uh, And I watched a lot of anime. (laughs) I'm, and I'm not even speaking on the anime part. I'm speaking on like, I, I can't tell you a live action TV show that has met as many well-developed people of color characters. Yeah. Uh, Especially space. Yeah. TV shows. I mean, I think uh, if we want to stay in the same realm, to be very close in both theme and style, uh, Firefly doesn't even have that. Mm-hmm. And, and I told you the- why. I told you why. You know now the secret. Oh, Whedon also. Uh, <laughs> well, it's because it's because Whedon was copying Cowboy oh, yeah. Bebop. <laughs> yes. Um, but as far as like, but like it, it, just saying as far as like that goes, um very like that's not there aren't diverse tv shows like this especially in the early 2000s and this is an anime that is and this is not only an anime but this is a anime from a culture that is very very famous for not having a lot of diversity yeah um because frankly also in japan it's really hard to integrate to so there are some but not a lot which means that they don't need to necessarily have representation on tv as much uh, so the fact that it is incredibly diverse with not only people of colors, multiple skin tones, but also the like amount of queer characters mm-hmm. in, the early, in the early 90s or the late 90s, early 2000s is I was shocked, shocked. My jaw dropped. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Diversity is like, never a punchline or a gimmick. Very true. You don't hear any no. jokes. Like the closest thing we get to a joke about somebody being diverse is people being surprised that Ed is a girl, but there's never a joke. They're just like genuinely surprised. Like, Oh, Ed's a girl. Wow. I can understand because in the early 2000s, the name Edward <laughs> does not yeah. scream, you know, woman. I mean, still, st- I'm sure that part of the reason you keep messing up Ed's pronouns is because their name is what? Ed. <laughs> Absolutely. So we get, we, and that's, that's the only thing, that's the only thing in the show that I can, that I can think of, but we have like, we have characters, um, as Milner is pointing out, we have Middle Eastern characters, we have black characters, we have Latino characters. Um, I, I have a screenshot in, in here of the, the lady at the, at the bar, um, you know, body diverse characters, like how many animes do you see people that look like, I mean, this looks like, like a mom, like I know this woman. You know, I know plenty of people that look like this, but you never see them in anime. It really did feel like the world blew up and everyone from everywhere came to space. And it, it feels, it feels real for that. Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciated it so much. And I appreciate the showrunners did an amazing job um, being able to do that. And especially being able to navigate what was culturally appropriate at the time in Japan um because I mean Japan has a history of being very homophobic uh their Mm -hmm. their culture is it's still it's still illegal to get married um Mm -hmm. but as far as like uh being able to have it in a show in the early 2000s representation and then have it cross to Adult Swim and not change any of the not change the majority of that representation unlike sailor moon is Mm -hmm. incredible um that it was able to happen it is it is a huge step forward or it's a huge step in like the art of it and also being able to have people here in america have access to that that early on is is fantastic Mm -hmm. and it just proves also that like you can have a diverse cast and still have a beloved show Right. And I feel like a lot of the stuff that comes out today. So I'm going to get on my my soapbox a little bit because it kind of like an, annoys me um, because a lot of uh, 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 corporations have realized that, guess what? L- LGBT people like seeing themselves in stuff. So you get a lot of things now where I feel like they make the characters identity 
their entire thing. Like we learn that they're gay before we learn anything else about them. Um, they're, they're being, you know, they're having issues with their gender is like the only plot they ever get or things like that. And, and I f it, to me, it feels very pandering. It feel it, it's, it doesn't feel like true to a story. It feels like they're just trying to like tick identity boxes to get, um, gay people to tune in. And I find that very frustrating, but Cowboy Bebop doesn't do that. Every single character is not about their identity. Their story is not about their identity, but the identity is still clear and there and it still affects them and their decision making even though their story is not about that and I just I just love that about Cowboy Bebop and and guys you know if you want the gays to watch like keep making more gay characters it's fine but please give them a story that's beyond just being gay please my whole, per my whole personality is me being gay though <laughs> I, have, I have no other interesting things about me but the mm -hmm. fact that I like to find what I find women attractive that's the yeah that's it about me Mm -hmm. um <laughs> it's it's the first thing anyone should learn about you and everything else um is, is just throwaway lines after that that is the one and only personality trait that i have yeah uh, <laughs> but yeah no i i 100 percent agree and and mm -hmm. a great yes that's a great example as far as like uh when faye came into the room and two men were sharing a bed uh yeah. and it was being about like interrupting people and not interrupting men a hundred percent uh there was also the episode where like Someone just makes a throwaway comment that they're not into women. I can't even remember what episode that. That's the one with. The I think it's actually the episode where we meet Gen. It's like early in that episode or something yes. like that. Like Spike is trying to gather information, um, and he's talking to these like um, either cross dressing or gay. I'm not really. Yes. It's not really super uh, clear. Prostitutes and um, and they're like, oh wait, he actually wouldn't purchase from us anyway. You know. Exactly, and it was, and it's just, it's. And, and Spike doesn't even blink and it's not a whole thing. And it's not like this, like, it also didn't make them extra taboo. It just was what it was. Mm -hmm. And that is something that like that casual diversity is something that we need so bad in yeah. so many forms of friggin' media these days. I wish I, I could see like, as far as that goes, I'm like every person who wants to build a TV show should watch this show for that reason alone yeah uh, if but don't just like, copy it and make firefly please oh, no. like make your own thing <laughs> even then firefly didn't do it successfully because you know joss whedon but like well also because and, people hadn't a lot of people hadn't seen i mean even though cowboy Bebop was popular it was still in, at the time it wasn't as popular as like a western oh, show so he knew he no, could no, no, no. he knew he could just copy cowboy bebop and people wouldn't notice and he wouldn't even have to yeah, mention it i mean firefly is a good show but uh <laughs> but as far as like the diversity goes, I'm like not even looking at like copying these ideas. I'm just being like, here is casual diversity. Get it in your head, showrunners. This is what we want. Yeah. And you're right, um, Kitty. It's not just the villains. It is throughout the show. It is it it happens in the main cast. Ed is uh is non-binary. It happens with the villains, with the bounties they go after. It happens with neutral side characters. It's across the board. It's across the board. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh it's it's really well done. And it's something that I 100% praise the show on. Um, yeah. I don't have to like the show or ever want to watch the show again, but I will sit there and I will say that this is, this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and it was something that I was, I noticed, I clocked and I, and it drove me through the entire way. And I also appreciate it that it did not ever waver. There was not a single episode where I'm like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of white looking people on the screen or a lot of, you know, <laughs> the same copy and paste version of people on the screen um uh -huh. it, it's amazing it's beautiful it's beautiful yeah i love it i love it. it even though the rest of cowboy bebop i don't want our future to be like this i i do want the future to be like this we can take this into the into our, our space just cowboy future like i yeah. just also like media shows take this this is what the world looks like yeah like, that's the other thing too is that this is not like uncommon in the world this is like literally i'm like i know that person i know that person i know that person in the robe i know that person with the blue hair like i know every single one of these people and yeah. i can run into them on any given day here in the world right like i can so, go to walmart and see all these people yes um <laughs> and you're <laughs> like and, and i could too and we're in two very different places in the same country but in two very different places yeah so it's just yes 100 percent yeah, more of this, guys. If you want more LGBT audience, do it like this. Stop just ticking identity checkboxes and thinking that's going to make a good show. This is the way to do it. 
and also POC. Like, I would love to actually yeah. see some of the main cast be people of color, but yeah, like yeah. there are still too many episodes where it's like this entire town is white. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this also um, a lot of people head canon uh, Jet as being a light skinned black person. Love that. And that's that's part of why in the in the uh, Netflix version they actually casted a black guy. I'm not gonna lie, I haven't seen any of the cast or anything for the live action, so I, all I know is that it premiered yesterday. Um, <laughs> but yeah that's a fandom that's a fandom thing um it's not explicit in the show because if he is black he is very pale um but uh but yeah that's that's a that's a headcanon that a lot of people have i think that's wonderful and then i think the the then recasting it as a black man doesn't change it actually probably makes the story better um but it doesn't change the inherent story of jet no and i think that's wonderful yeah i agree so, so yeah good job on diversity cowboy diversity. people but awesome. let's next talk about some of the things we don't want to bring in to the future about Cowboy but, Bebop. But having a great theme. Mm -hmm. um, that that gig economy, <laughs> that poverty circle, and the cycle of poverty, uh, yeah. and the, the constantly, hey, I need to work to pay my bills so that I can work. To pay my bills, um, to work to pay my bills, to work to pay my bills. <laughs> I need my ship in order to drive to my job, in order to pay for my ship, in order to drive to my job. Uh, gotta love that hustle yeah. that every single person uh, in at least America can relate to on some level, mm -hmm. um, especially those millennials and below. But man, oh man, oh man, that cycle yeah so like this is this is one of the crazy things in the show like we they say that they're really they're bad bounty hunters but they do actually win some bounties they do make money in some episodes but the second they make any money the money has to go into the ship or to restock the fridge or to to pay for some kind of medical issue that's happening right um and so and so like it's this thing about yeah you might make a bounty and make a make like you know a hundred thousand dollars but because of everything else now that hundred thousand dollars has to last you like two years or something ridiculous like that right so you can make a big chunk of money you could make a big chunk of money at once but it's irrelevant if it happens really sporadically and as soon as you make it most of it has to go into your bills <laughs> And it even and at this point it isn't even like a hundred thousand. Like there there are some bounties that were like millions. And yeah, like, you know that be gone because they need to. It's like buy gone. Food. Yeah, because um, <laughs> their fridge is empty and their ship is falling apart, and mm -hmm. you know. And none of them it's have just a bad. Fund. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, thirty percent of American workforce is gig workers. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, um, Milner. That sounds right to me. I I don't know. I don't know what the statistic is, that, but that sounds right. That absolutely doesn't surprise me and then also like gig workers are not just uh the only people who who live within the cycle of poverty so yeah. it's not even just gig workers but it's also you know every almost every american at some point in time has experienced the i need i'm living paycheck to paycheck i think that yeah. that statistic is close to 80. yeah um, most people are most people live paycheck to paycheck most people do not um get to save any money so you know you might ask like well just save money and it's like but if 80 percent of your paycheck goes to your bills and you have only 20 percent left for food and emergencies you have nothing that you can save and this relates to those who are experiencing that and that yeah. audience has only grown since the early 2000s. That yeah. audience has only expanded um, by the 2008 market crash and the, you know, the most recent one as well, um, where where people and now with the uh, with the Great Resignation, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, experiencing right now, most people understand this and get this, and so the fact that this can still resonate, we're talking 20 years later, is. Is awesome. I mean, it's great. It's great for the that a show is able to stick around that much, but it also sucks that our economy is in the same place. That well, I mean, it just it just means the problems have always been here. The problems have been here for can, for yeah. for forever, and they and only get worse and worse and worse over time. And hopefully, they'll get better. But right now, they're not. Uh, and yeah, so and I don't. I mean, we don't foresee we don't foresee them getting better in the near future. I mean, there's no there's not really enough pressure. So, by the way, if you can afford to, um, you know, if you can afford to quit your job and they're mistreating you, then quit. Like, I mean, if you don't like your job and you can afford to quit it, like, don't make yourself hungry, okay? But if you can, don't let people treat you like that. Just quit. 
And there are also, other jobs. Uh, if you can't quit right now, but you should, I understand. Like, that's the other thing, yeah. too. Sometimes you quitting is not possible, and there is nothing wrong with you for not being able to quit. Uh, to keep you and yours safe. But yeah. if you can quit, uh, do it um, <laughs> or get fired. <laughs> get that sweet, sweet unemployment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at least for a little while. <laughs> If you can encourage uh, them to make you part of the next layoff, go for it. <laughs> that. Uh, you know, report I mean, and, I, and I've been in that situation too, where like I kept a job that I didn't want to keep because I did not have a choice. Um, I, I applied for other jobs and, and was unsuccessful finding them. And, um, you know, I have a house to take care of and, and a family and, and pets and they depend on me, you know? And so we've all been in that situation before. I think, I think all of these things are incredibly relatable um, to, to basically uh, all uh, modern economies. Um, I don't know how bad it is in Europe. I think they have probably the best deal out of that, that type of a economy, but, um, but even probably most Europeans, this probably applies to as well. Yeah. And I mean, in the gig economy where you are a freelance worker is always going to be terrible no matter what. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Because you're constantly, there is no stability. Yeah. It's precarious. Um, and I think that that is something that the show shows really well. Um, yeah. And then not only does the show show that really well, but it shows the morality behind it mm -hmm. of in this particular thing of, okay, at what point am I a sellout? At what yeah. point am I willing to cross my morality and my beliefs to to get fed? Yeah. Uh, to be able to afford a roof over my head in order to afford the things that I need for my ship. At what point am I willing to sacrifice my beliefs and needs to get the actual base needs in which I need to survive? Yeah. Uh, and that is something that that the that the bebop comes across many times in mm -hmm. their in their episodes. Yeah. And, and uh, people say things like there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. I think there's no ethical work under capitalism. I have not. never, <laughs> ever in my life had a job where I thought that I was contributing to something that fit my morals purely. I mean, I've had things that were closer than others, but I've never had something that I think aligned with my morals 100 percent ever. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pushing it. I'm not fired yet. So we'll see how long my morals last. <laughs> uh, they're letting me get away with a lot right now where I work. Uh, but we'll see. Um, and even then, yeah, you have to contribute to the thing. And, and also there is no such thing as right for all. Like that's yeah. the other thing too. And if that's where your morality is, uh, is located, then, then you're going to constantly be under that bar, which yep. again is just the reality of living in a society where we're very individualized. Um, but I think that it's, it's really important to talk about and see that representation and that theme be mm -hmm. accessible to so many people and yep. the fact that this is again a anime a cartoon that was available in the early 2000s showing these themes that was marketed directly towards children even if this theme was supposedly going over their head uh this theme still i mean it went over my head until i was part of the 2008 um market crash and i couldn't find a job and then it kind of like oh <laughs> that's what cowboy bebop was talking about <laughs> god damn it <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but absolutely again like yeah there is there is a point in time where all of these characters question was questioned with their morality yeah. and what they would be willing to do in order to survive versus what they would be willing to do in order to keep their beliefs about themselves alive yep um, and the show and itself I, has episodes surrounding this oh, like yeah. i know we wanted to mention the the ganymede sea rat episode so um the ganymedes in the ganymede sea rat episode there basically is this this creature on ganymede that um that is considered a delicacy that that people eat but the reality is that this creature um was uh was marketed this way purposefully because it was very kind of cheap and easy to collect exactly like lobster in our real world. Um, for those of y'all that don't know, lobster was considered like trash food, you know? And, and it, it, if you've eaten lobster, I've, I've, I mean, I know in Maine it's different, Landon, but um, if you've eaten like, lobster, you if you've eaten lobster, it's basically less flavorful shrimp. Like there's nothing special about it compared to any other shellfish. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's a lie, but anyway. that's not a lie. But again, <laughs> come sea up rat. here and let me prove it to you. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure in in the uh, northeast where it is is actually not native. Present. 
then it tastes much better, okay? But here in the South, shrimp tastes much better. So I'm just saying, don't throw hands with me, Koffel Rafter. Don't throw hands. This okay, Landon will agree with you. But the Ganymede sea rat is the same thing in, in this universe, right? It's just like lobster. And the whole episode is about these, um, these eco-terrorists who come in and decide that saving the Ganymede sea rat is more important than people, right? They're basically PETA, um, and, and that's how they do. And, uh, and so, and this is, this is, I think, episode, it's definitely in the first half, but I don't think it's towards the beginning so much, but it's definitely in the first half. So it's just another time where the show is like, hey, Bang. Do you get it yet? Bang. I'm just, I'm hitting you over the head with it. Do you get it yet? Do you get it? <laughs> you don't. Uh, and you still, and as a kid, you still did. No, um, I didn't. I just thought like, wow, Ed's really cool. And I like space. I mean, I don't know. The themes, <laughs> the themes didn't hit me in, in that way. I mean, I mean, I'm sure I internalized them somewhat, but, um, but I didn't really grasp it, you know? Um, but no, it was the, the whole sea rat thing was a perfect metaphor for uh a the situation at hand uh and that like we we put worth as a society where we decide worth is Mm -hmm. um and that it is also heavily heavily influenced by capitalism oh yeah Uh, if if something is marketed as nice and rich and quality then it's going to people are going to start believing that and it doesn't mm-hmm. actually have to be good or better than the other. Um, but that is that is how trends and capitalism works. And and not only to that like extent, but also how then people are then like in are finding those those things such as the sea rats more important than yep. human lives. Uh, is also a huge, a huge thing that exists in there because we, in a capitalist system, find that like the quality of our Starbucks is more important than the fact that Starbucks is mistreating, uh, is mistreating their employees. Like, yeah, I mean, it, it can be for sure. You know, because it's like, we like to think we have, we like to think we have a consumer based equality that you can like vote with your dollar, but you can't. We have a supply based economy. We have a supply based economy. (laughs) Like Starbucks decides that they're good. You know, we do not decide that Starbucks is good. Starbucks decides that they're good and they tell us this. And if we did like have money and power and and, like power with our dollar, uh, may like there wouldn't be any Chick-fil-A's in very blue liberal states <laughs> like True. They're, they're like they wouldn't be like there's some now in Maine which is insane because they haven't come up to here yet they wouldn't be rebuilding and expanding to the extent that they are because there mm-hmm. are so many people who are not purchasing those uh and and the reality is is that we as as people within a capitalist society don't have any power over we don't capitalism. boycotts don't work which is they just don't <laughs> I mean strikes and strikes work to an extent Strikes um, work way better than any other tool we have, but but you but they still are not the it. best. <laughs> They're still not the best, and in this economy where people are destitute with poverty, uh, it, it again faces up to that idea of what is my morality versus what is my survival, and yeah. can I survive taking the risk of a strike and not getting a paycheck? Yeah. Uh, and can I can I survive that? Can my family survive that? And yeah. that is the reality that we are facing, and the reality that is whether it's like directly highlighted and and said aloud in this metaphor or just alluded to, is incredibly important. Yeah, for sure. And it's and it's really sad in Cowboy Bebop, and this is becoming more and more true in, in at least the U.S. I'm not sure about the rest of the world. I assume it's true in the West, rest of the world too. But in Cowboy Bebop, being a gig worker is the rule. It's not the exception. Pretty much everybody in Cowboy Bebop is um, is a gig worker. Uh, we don't really meet other characters that are outside of this system, and that tells me either one of two things. Either everyone in this show basically is a gig worker and that's how the universe works or the stratification between the rich and poor is so strong that your regular workers are never going to interact with a rich person ever. Yeah, and I I like to personally believe that it's that uh, because that is so much truer to real life than necessarily. Yeah. Um, 
than than the other option just because there is such a huge like we're growing more and more shadified from the upper one percent of our yeah. country uh and of our world um but i think that that's like something that's very fascinating of they are the rich playing games in the ivory tower and here are people just trying to live their lives and survive down here yep. and, we, and we meet um, like one rich person i think i've got a picture of him on here um i don't know if it's like one or two clicks away but we do meet one rich person on here our cowboy larper right um and uh and oh one one more click i think yeah this oh, guy yeah. yeah this guy so we do meet one rich person here and and the whole reason that he's even interested in in doing this like cowboy LARP thing because he's a rich person he doesn't need to be part of the gig economy right he, he can do whatever he wants is because it's glorified like it's glorified on shows like Big Shot that uh that all the characters watch and everybody thinks like oh it's so cool to be a gig worker you make your own hours you do what you want you take out bad guys everybody gets to be the hero pew, pew. you know it's very cool right it's very cool um but the reality of all the characters that we actually meet the only one that's having any fun with it is the rich larper well and this also sounds incredibly familiar to shows that exist nowadays yeah then, where it's like oh it's really like i'm thinking particularly the first thing that came to mind was the show cops and how yes. many and how many future cops that show inspired as being like this is such a cool high stakes job that you're saving lives and helping yeah. people adrenaline really rush every day really and then you're like why are all these people seeking an adrenaline rush uh and also assume that everyone is out to get them uh, applying for this job oh well actually it's because our system corrupted uh the people who are applying for this and also yep. everything it's because we told them that we told them that that's what we marketed as and then you also yeah. I mean, everything from that to like and then this larping thing i couldn't help but think of like the show undercover boss mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and being like mm -hmm. oh my god like this is a literal show about a person who is unaware of what is happening in their company and how hard it is to actually work but that's not how it's marketed yes it's also marketed that it's like oh and they're finding the bad employees and it's so much fun and wouldn't you want to do this and maybe your boss is an undercover boss Ooh. and like this whole bullshit thing and it really does play into this into this like the rich are playing games with the poor but you never see them you know that they exist but you never interact with them because they yeah. are so separated and i think also like the whole sea rat thing plays into that as well um because there is this higher echelon people that are being marketed to that can afford these things and the only reason that jet and spike can afford it in this particular episode is because they just had a big bounty uh, and they don't have two extra mouths or three extra mouths to feed. <laughs> um, yeah. At that point. Yeah. In time. I, mean, I think they do have Ayn at this point, but I think that's it. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. And Ayn's yeah. a dog, so he can eat dog yeah. food. I mean, <laughs> so can Faye, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting level of like distraction, too. Yeah. And that's, again, the, the show being so popular of being like, become a bounty hunter, become a gig worker like it glorifies that it's probably a cheaper expense of labor not having to fight to like pay and fund an international or interplanetary like defense force to find escaped or wanted criminals um <laughs> it's probably cheaper mm -hmm, to like hire, mm -hmm. hire yeah the Rando. same reason why our military hires mercenaries a lot of times instead of using our soldiers are they ready to talk about that though um <laughs> But no, it's, it's, that's a huge part of it, right? And that's like, and then they're advertising it. So it's like anyone can get into it. And it's, it's the Lulu Lemo, Lemon. It's the, it's the pyramid scheme of, uh, yeah. of, of shows. And it really does show that. And it shows this like, you can get rich quick. And we, as the audience who surrounds these, 20, these 26 episodes and spends it with people, understand that it is not a get rich scheme kind of thing yeah. and um, everyone's part of the machine everyone's part of the machine like the two actors that are on big shots um at the end the the guy the guy on the show you see him at the airport with his mom basically saying like hey you know the big shot show is over sorry mom you know i don't i, I don't have money anymore and um they basically they have this sweet little conversation but um but it basically boils down to like, you know, sorry. And it's just, it's so sad because it just really shows that everyone we meet in this show is part of the machine in one way or another. 
whether they're perpetuating it, whether they're trapped in it, whether, you know, what they're, they're trying to do their best, but they're all in it. Yeah. And like, they're all in it. I think that that's very true to real life. And I yeah. think it's very hard to find any show that is trying to make its people heroes, right? Most yeah. media that that is most media try to make their protagonists especially like cool bounty hunter-esque protagonists mm-hmm. um above the level of the common yeah um and this show doesn't shy away from the fact that even though they are advertised as above level because they are they're famous bounty hunters um they are not above the common they're not that's something that's really really cool to see yeah, like I hope in the live action that we get this shot right here of uh, of Spike in the puffy pink jacket saying, um, you, "You think I look like I got money?" Um, I just want to I just want to see a live action, you know, of that costume and him saying that line. <laughs> I do appreciate what Katie said in the chat. That was a big like, can't be too bad for Spike. He's wearing a ninety eight degrees first down jacket <laughs> and being like. <laughs> <laughs> he, listen he picked that up at the goodwill okay yeah he probably but, borrowed that from a friend and just forgot to return it let's be he real did not and by a friend he said he stole it from one of the people he hunted mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah that means like a bounty <laughs> but but the other thing that's this that cowboy bebop like really drives this home is like no matter how much you try to stay out of this system you cannot like Faye, we learn about her background eventually and she wasn't really like part of this system. She was just kind of living her life, doing her thing. Like she was going to school. She had friends, you know, um, it's, it, it, it was what it was. Her life was like pretty normal looking, or at least what we would consider like a normal virtuous life. Right. But then she gets trapped in this medical debt from, from a situation that she did not ask for. She wasn't, she, it was just a pure accident, you know? So it's like the system is so powerful that it traps everyone it traps everyone and there's nothing you can do to escape it and so you know if you don't believe that then just look at all of the different times that they have to go to the doctor it only happens a couple times look at Faye's medical debt story um there's no one there's no one that can escape the system yeah so it's it's Faye's medical debt it's not wanting jet not wanting to get a uh get a new arm because mm-hmm. a he knows he can never afford it and b he doesn't want to need debt um yeah. and well, I think he could get he could afford it but then he'd be paying that bill for forever right yes uh and then also um one of them gets sick so many episodes um isn't it I think Spike gets sick right and they they don't talk about taking him to the doctor yeah I mean any pretty much the only the the times they go to the doctor is when when they have to so um I know in the toys in the attic episode when they all start getting sick no one mentions like maybe we should call a doctor you know that's just not even a thing the only time they talk about doctors is when people are injured so like when Gen is injured and Spike is helping Gen back into their ship um, you know, Spike does make a comment that says, I don't even know if a doctor will come out here, right? But they never consider doctors for illness or sickness. They only consider doctors for injury, right? Mm-hmm. What does that sound like? Kind of kind of sounds like the, the US medical system, just saying. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Wonder if that's a thing. Yeah. All right. Um, we are at the final three minutes. Yeah. Do you wanna start talking about re- if it resonates or not? Yeah, let's go to the end. Okay, so We've talked a lot about Cowboy Bebop, and you know we come at this from very different um, backgrounds as far as the the types of media that we've consumed goes. But um, but I think we've had very similar life experiences in regards to like economic things. Um, so that being said, um, Landon, I know this was a, a different experience for you, but still, did it resonate? Yes, there are certainly parts that resonated there are certainly themes that felt very real to life again diversity um looking at the medical bills and the gig economy and looking at um and looking at on a different level i think that that all absolutely resonated uh is this a show that's going to be in my ultimate tops probably not um however i think that there are some great takeaways from this show and some great lessons to be learned and some things that people should should re- watch this show for, uh, especially if we are trying to make live action, diverse, interesting shows. Uh, so yes, absolutely resonated. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, what about you, Karen? Did this for the fifth time resonate? <laughs> I mean, obviously. I love Cowboy Bebop. And and the themes of Cowboy Bebop only resonate more and more and more as we just barrel headfirst towards late stage capitalism. And, you know, so when I first watched it as a kid, I was just like, wow, this is crazy diverse and Ed's so funny. You know, and so it resonates in, in that way. But then, like, as, as I get older and, and, you know, and I'm farther and farther in my career and things like that, different things about it resonate with me. And um, so, it, you know, it never it this is something that I that I think will continue to resonate more and more and more. Uh, you know, as I get older and as I, you know, get farther in my career and as we um, are witnessing the death throes of, of late stage capitalism, right? Yes. And um, I don't know, it's, it's always fun to glimpse our future. Yeah. Uh, also, <laughs> I am laughing at this thing in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's sorry. take a I moment to admire like, the 35 year old in the middle of that shot. <laughs> I'm able to keep it together because I, yeah, you're right really young looking Jet's not 35 Jet's not 35 <laughs> it, I refuse I, I hate to I hate to tell you this Karen but we don't get to control canon so that is 35 <laughs> it's a drawing it's what age I say it is okay I'm just saying Jet's a drawing he's not a real person I I I can say what age he is and he is not 35 Okay, That's my just, take. <laughs> you just know that we are bending the rules for this. And now don't care. Don't care. Canon. Anime's always oh. dumb like that, though. Anime's always dumb with how, like, oh, yeah. young they have the characters and or it doesn't make old. any sense. I will never understand how the Sailor Moon girls are 13 years old. They're not! They They're are. not! They are. I know, but even in the beginning of the show, they don't act like thirteen-year-olds. Have you met like real thirteen-year-olds? They're annoying as fuck. Like they're did like. You just, did you just ask me that? I mean, I know you have. I'm asking the chat. Like, when's the last time you interacted with a 13 year old? They don't act like Sailor Moon characters, okay? They do, they do in fact, sometimes act like Serena. Well, that's true. Maybe they do act like her. Yeah, maybe they do act like Usagi a little bit. But have you ever met a 13 year old that acts like Amy or Ray? Like, no. Yeah. That's not real. Actually, I have a, I have a very Ray like person in my class. Um, One yeah, out of fifty-five, yeah, right? Thirteen-year-old <laughs> girls are very diverse. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, no one in their right mind acts like Tuxedo Mask, though, or or no. Damien, or whatever his name is. Yeah, no, uh, you're right, Mamaru. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. So this resonated. Yeah. Good yeah. show. I listen. There are worse anime. <laughs> I wouldn't I pick a bad one. I, I wouldn't make you watch a bad that. anime. <laughs> I wouldn't make you watch a bad anime. Uh, it's I because promise. you are convinced that I'll one day be a be a uh, anime head, and someday we'll watch something where it just clicks with you. You just need to keep trying. It's just like kids if they tell you when your kids tell you I don't like to read. I'm sure they tell you that. Yeah, huh? they just got to find the right mm -hmm. book. Uh -huh. You just got to find the right <laughs> anime, Landon. All right. <laughs> now I understand how annoying I am to my children. <laughs> We're gonna keep trying. We're gonna keep trying. Love. That. Um, but even though even though it wasn't your preferred medium, I think it still speaks to how good this show is that you were able to have a lot of good stuff from it. I yeah, I genuinely um, I think it connected. It didn't feel like what I assume anime would feel like, and I don't know if that's because this show is special or just because I have a skewed opinion on what I think anime would feel like. <laughs> um, but it feels again diverse. It feels really like being able to to see all the different characters ensemble esque instead of one main character like it it feels really good i like it yeah um yeah. it's it resonates <laughs> yep all right guys so that is our show for today we are gonna talk just a minute about where you can find us um before we close out but before i do that i just want to say thank you guys so much for um for coming and hanging out i see we have a lot of viewers i think most of them are bots if you're not bots i apologize for calling you bots i would love to hear from you um so speak up in the chat please or toss me a follow if you liked what you saw um we're gonna be next time doing um don't starve again so we're gonna do don't starve together for next saturday and uh and and it's uh this will be landon's birthday stream also her birthday is um is after is, is around uh thanksgiving time and so we don't but we don't stream thanksgiving week so this the final november stream is always landon's birthday stream so we're gonna do don't starve that's what she picked 
Uh, she wanted to do that again. Yeah, so I was terrible we're gonna at it the first time. I'm gonna we're going to do better this time. We're going to do better. The second time. So come play with me. It's <laughs> yes. my birthday. I'm queen of the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, also on Thursday, I will be playing more Final Fantasy X. Um, I do a Thursday stream that's called Artistic License that is uh, 6.30 to 8.30 Eastern. And we are finally getting to the end of the game. We have finished up getting all the Celestial Weapons. And we're going to go, go kill Sin, guys. So if you want to come kill God with me, come hang out on Thursday. Um, I also have a YouTube channel where all the VODs go up, all that good stuff. So that's where you can find me. And uh, Landon, I have a couple questions for you. The first one is, when is our next media stream? And what are we doing? Oh my God, why are you asking me that? <laughs> because I know you know the answer. Oh, thank you for the applause, Kitty. Landon can now live another week. Ah, thank you so much. Love this as I open up the schedule for what we're doing next. It's, it's the first Saturday of December. Landon. It's the first Landon. Saturday of December. Is it the Matrix? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a professional. Uh, we're going to do the first Saturday of December, which is December 4th. Well, mm -hmm. 4, in fact, right here on Karen Terry's Twitch stream. And we're going to be doing The Matrix which is mm -hmm. a movie I have never seen. Yep. Uh, you'll discover this is a theme for the episodes that for the things that we are choosing from now on. Uh, unless I've chosen it, I've never seen it. Um, <laughs> and uh, not only are we gonna do The Matrix, but the following week after that, we're gonna do The Matrix sequels mm -hmm. uh, to prepare for the fourth one. Yeah, because they're making a fourth coming one. Out. It's coming out in December. <laughs> the fourth one coming out in December. Uh, so if you'd like to also see our review on that too maybe we'll do that too um but definitely check us out on the fourth i need to watch those uh because i haven't done that yet <laughs> but it won't be quite like this like landon has still like seen science oh, yeah. fiction stuff before like it's not like a total new totally new genre she just hasn't seen these movies specifically i mean i haven't seen most movies um yeah. so this is no this will be great and i and it'll be the matrix it's yeah. keanu reeves right that's who's in it yes um, yes so it's gonna he's a gentleman i'm gonna love it Obviously yeah the bullet and the thingy and i know i know some things I'm not a complete noob um <laughs> all right so here's all my socials and then um landon where can everybody find you i'll put your socials in the chat too you can find me on instagram at land in maine um yes. please come follow me maybe i'll start posting funny videos there uh, because I can't post funny videos anywhere else anymore. Yeah. Um, but Sad. I, I will one day stop being bitter about it, but it's, I love it. So come follow me on Instagram. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at land in Maine. I have spicy hot takes, but also Taylor Swift dropped a new album. So there's a lot of just sobbing over that happening. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy for Taylor that she's able to re-release her new so her songs by the way that's just wonderful for her I can't handle it this is the fourth album since COVID hit it's so much right now my poor wallet well it's probably um, easy yeah. it's easier for her to release them when it's just her redoing her old songs so you know oh yeah I'm not angry at it I'm just exhausted and broke <laughs> um <laughs> but you know what if you want to just see me like visually crying in the shower uh but like on twitter version come watch it'll be fun i will go crazy yeah um <laughs> lunar is going crazy you mentioned taylor swift oh my uh, gosh don't worry i also sobbed many times to all too well the 10 minute version um <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> uh but karen where can they find you Okay, so um, it's on, on YouTube. Um, you can also find me here on Twitch. I have the two streams. We stream on Saturday. That's kind of my group stream where it's like community days or, or these media episodes with Landon and various things like that. Um, and then all my VODs go up on, on YouTube. So yeah, that's that's all the things. Um, all of the socials for both of us are in the chat. You'll go follow us. Um, all of that wonderful stuff. Thank you so much to all the okay. bots hanging out that I'm now that you haven't replied, I'm going to really assume that you're bots um, boosting up my view count. So thank okay. you. I, okay. I, I feel like I got a service for free because I didn't buy any viewers, but I feel like I bought viewers. So <laughs> that's cool, I guess. <laughs> thank you. Also, I'm just going to put this out for Karen Terry because I bullied her into this. Uh, you can go ahead and follow her YouTube channel because one day, eventually, maybe there will be a dice making video. Yes, uh, there will. Because she might be making dice. I, well, supplies are coming. Supplies are coming. So if you want an update on where I am with dice, I will make sure to do that on Thursday's stream. Um, right now, nothing has happened. There are no updates because I'm still waiting on stuff to come from Amazon. This so hopefully me, I'll have an update for you guys on Thursday. This is me manifesting. Okay. <laughs>
all right go follow her youtube but also yeah. follow us here especially yeah. these 32 bots <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. We are gonna raid um Jed today. He um he yeah. Instead of he normally streams on like uh does does a big stream on Fridays, but he wasn't feeling too well yesterday, so he's doing his big stream today. And towards the end of the stream, he's doing his kill kill him with kindness segment. And what that is is basically a bunch of people from Elixir. Uh, base rap battle, but it's not like negative. It's like positive rap battles. It's really cool. Um, it's like one of the one of my favorite pieces of content out of Elixir. Which, if you're not in there, it is a um is a Twitch, uh is a Twitch um collaboration and uh, and networking server. So there's the link to that. But anyway, we're, we're gonna go raid Jedlin because um he's really awesome and um and it's gonna be a kill him with kindness stream, which is my favorite piece of his content. So there we go. Yay! That's just gonna count down. So I'll, we'll give a few seconds for that to go. Um, but that being said, thank you guys again for hanging out with us. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All bye. right. Bye, guys. I'll see you later. Have fun in Jed's stream.